Hello, bonjour, and anin. Welcome to OISE and TDSB EcoSchool seminar titled From Anxiety to Agency, Transformative Pedagogies to Inspire Climate Action by Maria Van Valis from OISE. And if you are not in the right place, please do double check your link. And if you are in the right place, then a very warm welcome to you for taking the time to attend the seminar this early in the morning. Uh, so my name is Maha Urshit, pronouns she, her, and I am a graduate student in the final year of my master's of teaching program at OISE. I will be your host for today. We also have Jackson Fellow helping out, a volunteer, a student from OAZ. Today's session will be recorded, so please make sure your microphones remain off for the duration of the seminar. Feel free to use the chat and any questions will be addressed at the end of the talk. So if you keep some comments and your questions for the end, that would be much appreciated. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our presenter for today, Maria. So Maria Mamalis is a PhD candidate focusing her research on pedagogies for climate justice that nurture meaning, purpose, and hope in learners. Prior to her doctoral studies, she has been an educator in the public school system for over a decade. She currently supports educators, institutions, and not-for-profit organizations to respond impactfully to the climate crisis. I myself am incredibly excited to hear her talk. And given the state of many youth feeling the burden of having to fix the world, climate anxiety has been incredibly pervasive. And I don't know if you're following COP26, uh, but um, if you watch Greta Thunberg talk, many leaders are just going, and in her words, blah, 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 and not showing that hope comes with action. Um, and so Maria here is bringing a focus on what can be done. And again, that most important piece, hope in action. So Maria, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Maha, and thank you, Jackson, for supporting the session, and thank you to all of you, and good morning. Uh, it is truly a pleasure to be here with you today, um, especially in the fact that COP26 uh, is happening, and um, I think these issues have never been more relevant. I know I know some of you who, who are in this um, workshop have been, like I have, really committed to climate justice education over the course of our, our professional careers, and uh, at times it's been lonely, I will say that, you know, 20 years ago, it was sometimes felt really lonely and heavy lifting doing this work. And the, the, one of the things that gives me hope is that more and more people are really coming together to do this work and to take on this work. And so I just want to acknowledge that how many people, um, you know, have come today to, to the conference and, and to the session and I see that momentum growing. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the land and um, you know one of my favorite artists is Christy Belcourt she is a incredible Métis artist if you see her work up close she actually follows a sort of Métis beadwork um, methodology so that she the tip of the paintbrush is used and if you saw her images up close it looks like little beads that have actually come together and this piece, The Wisdom of the Universe, I find so beautiful and such a stunning visual representation of our interconnectedness. Um, but I'm also just aware, uh, you know, the land that I'm on, I'm in Dish with One Spoon Treaty territory. And I think a great deal about what it means for me to regenerate the treaty relationships and restore the treaty relationships in the place where I am. And so I do want to sorry, moved over a slide. I do want to acknowledge um, the land and my teachers. I want to acknowledge Gondakwaste and Longboat. I want to acknowledge Grandma Shirley John, Ojibwe elder knowledge keeper um, from Saugeen First Nation. I want to acknowledge Grandma Vera White Eye Jones. Um, these women are living laboratories of living libraries of the land. Um, and they have played such an important role in my life. Um, the knowledge that they have generously shared with me. And I feel that I am accountable when I think about accountability, that accountability for me is, is very concrete. I feel accountable um, to them as I, as I do the work, as I try to walk in a good way and, um, and try to live and embody what truth and reconciliation means in these times. So I really want to bring them in, in and acknowledge that any mistakes or errors certainly are mine. <laughs> I, do not, I do not speak for them. I just want to acknowledge the role they've played in my own, um, my own learning. So I have a critical challenge for you today that I want to invite us into. And so I ask you to kind of start a thought space, whether digitally, um, whether on a piece of paper, and the question that we're going to be exploring together today 
is how might we intentionally and impactfully nurture agency and authentic hope in our learners in relation to the climate crisis. And what I hope to do today is provide you with, with a, a few things, some research, because I believe you need to be um, armed with research in the best sense of that word to go into schools and make the case for why climate justice needs to be centered within our spaces. So I wanna give you some of those tools. I wanna give you some examples and ideas and I have a whole resource list for you of concrete things that you can do based on research informed pedagogies in this area. I wanna give you time for some conversation with each other and a bit of time for Q&A. So that's gonna be uh, what I hope to accomplish together in this hour. So to start us off, um, you know, in light of the yesterday, we had what was supposed to be 10,000 people show up for the Fridays for Future and 100,000 showed up. So that is a reason to be hopeful right there. We had 10 times the number show up. Um, I'm going to invite you right now in the chat, if you wouldn't mind developing an insightful and informative caption for this series of photographs. So if you had to give this series of photographs one caption that's insightful and informative, what would it be? Okay, so Morgan says radical embodiment. Yes. <laughs> Astrid's mentioned. I love it, Morgan. <laughs> yeah. Astrid's mentioned when I look at you, I have hope for the future. Yes. Taylor says climate strikes back. <laughs> yes. The next generation, hopeful. I love these. We must all stand together for climate action now. Yes, youth around the world stand against the climate crisis. So this, this is our context. So we think about education and that it happens in, in response to culture, society, history. This is, the, this is what is happening amongst other things, but this is currently a global movement of young people who are rising up and taking a stand for climate justice. Absolutely, taking their future into their own hands. We have students here represented in Nigeria, in Germany, in Brazil, in India. And, we, and I have in the link, this is from a series of photographs of climate strikes around the world, a beautiful thing to bring into your classrooms. And so I've got a link for those photographs for you um, to really show this is agency in action when we're talking about that. What we also know is, and this was the study that Sarah briefly mentioned that was published in The Lancet in early September, but this is a critical groundbreaking study. Um, again, I think very important for us as we do our work as educators, because it's telling us, um, this study was conducted with 10,000 students in 10 countries, <clears throat> 16 to 25 year olds, 59% are very or extremely worried for their future. 84% are quite worried for their future. 50% of young people are sad, anxious, feel powerless, feel helpless, feel guilty, feel shame. Um, the, the, there's a high number of young people who are experiencing anxiety around the world. I think what's also really interesting to note is that students in both Brazil and the Philippines, so we're thinking about climate justice and that global north, global south relationship, youth in Brazil and the Philippines that are experiencing climate, the climate crisis most acutely. In Brazil, we're seeing that through the destruction of the Amazon rainforest in the Philippines with typhoons and hurricanes that are happening now. Young people's anxiety levels were higher in both of those countries. So we're, again, we're seeing how this global north, global south, most more impacts are being felt in the global south. But this is being felt across the globe of all young people. And what is causing their distress the most isn't actually the dire scenarios. I mean, yes, that is certainly concerning them. Young people feel gaslit by government and adult inaction in the face of the science. That is what is causing their distress. Young people literally feel gaslit by adults for their inaction. Because what they are seeing is the science is telling us this, 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 and this, and you are doing this, 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 and this. It does not compute. So this is an issue of citizenship. It is an issue of justice. It is an issue of moral 
really moral injury that is being caused to young people. So absolutely education systems need to respond. When I was, uh, when I was, uh, actually first I wanna ask you to put your own feelings in, in relation to what you are understanding about young people. If you could put that in the mentee and I, I'm just, give me a moment to stop the share. I, I tried to be so organized and it, it still was not letting me put my pre-links um, in the Zoom chat. So just give me a second here to do that. So in the mentee, I'm asking you the question to respond to the question, what feelings do you have when you contemplate? And there, um, just go to the very end, you'll see the mentee there. What feelings do you have when you contemplate the rising levels of youth anxiety and distress in relation to the climate crisis. Okay, so if you could go there to the mentee, I'm gonna go over there now and I'm going to share my screen as we start to see this come to life. Okay, so what I'm seeing is folks are talking about frustration, urgency, anxiety, heartbreak despair, compassion, overwhelmed, sadness, duty, horror. Yeah, thank you for, um, for sharing. I mean, again, having been in this space for so many years, uh, I, I do share with people, um, you know, I, have, I absolutely have terrible days. I have days where I cry. I have days where I feel a lot of despair. Um, uh, I have days where I stay up at night, uh, evenings where I stay up at night thinking. Um, and one of the things that helps me is to really name those feelings and be in community and, and find others who, um, you know, where we can process our feelings. I find that really, really important for me to move from my own anxiety, my own despair, my own sadness into agency, into doing, into doing this workshop, into researching, into educating, into coming together with others and being part of the change. And that's, and, and so I just want to say that as we're feeling all this, to recognize that we are in community together right now, that we are holding this as a community that we all like the fact that you are here today is testament to the fact that you care that you are you are acting that you are part of this change and this is where we find hope there's a greek expression i'm greek hope dies last um, and so i don't have a pollyannish hope i'm very well aware of the data um, and at the same time i also see constant reminders of what is possible, of never foreclosing our imagination, of never foreclosing um, the human spirit and, and what it is capable of. So I wanna thank you for, for sharing your thoughts about that. You know, again, our young people are feeling all of that and more. Um, you know, this is something that they are having to grapple with, we're all grappling with, but they're grappling with in a particular way and, and at a developmentally vulnerable time. And so what we do in the classroom really matters. Um, according to Kanu and Glore, agency can only be nurtured in curricular and pedagogical contexts that build on the knowledge, experience, autonomy, and judgment of students. So we have to center what our students know, what they're feeling, what they're experiencing. And respecting children's rights, their voice and agency contributes to well-being and is an important component of human and social development. So if that study that tells us that really we are in danger of violating children's rights with inaction on climate, then we have to, as a moral response, as an ethical response, really support um, action and action in our classrooms. When I was a student at OISE 20 years ago, and I know there are some number of MT students, um, a number, some of you told me in the first group that you still have to do the, the portfolio. I had to do a portfolio. It wasn't a digital portfolio. I imagine today, 20 years later, you have to do a digital portfolio about your, you know, your beliefs and you know, as your work and everything as an educator. So I had to do it and we used to buy these little booklets at Staples and sort of create it. Well, on my very first page was a quote from Bell Hooks. 
who Sarah mentioned today. And it was, for all its limitations, the classroom remains a place of possibility. And that we can really use our classrooms to imagine and transgress beyond the borders and boundaries of what's been laid out. And that's been my inspiration. And so when we talk about this work of climate justice, I see classrooms as a profound site of transformation for action. Um, the role of meaningful students need to be participating as we do at the human level, meaningful activities. This is fundamental to our well being. The learning has to be meaningful to them. And a focus on agency, as Manukina and Wise point out, is crucial not only for personal empowerment of students, but it's important for the wider social, political, and economic purposes. So the ability to respond effectively to climate change requires a strong sense of agency, which is the belief in one's capacity to that the things that you do, the things that you believe, actually make a difference in your community, in the world around you, in your life. That's what agency fundamentally means, that the decisions and actions and beliefs that you have make a difference, can have an impact. So this is what we want to be supporting our learners to feel and, and to have that sense that the decisions and actions they make can have a difference. If we're centering youth voice, we want to know what did they say is actually needed within formal educational contexts. So they say that they need to be involved in decision making. This was a study that was done, and I'm going to share the link with you. Commit to equity and removing structural and systemic barriers. They want whole school approaches that are collaborative across schools and community organizations and businesses. They want this to go out into the world. They want their learning around climate change to not just be a little thing we do on this day, <laughs> but they want to actually be taking action. And they want more project-based learning and to harness technology and social media to do this work. Sheila, I hear you. It is a frustration that the school board and curriculum, and we need to be pushing up against all of that right now and doing this work and really responding with that sense of moral agency for what's needed in our schools and in our classrooms. Um, what did young people say about decarbonizing? This is a report that was done, beautiful work that's been done from um, the Center for Global Education at University of uh, University of Alberta, taking it global. They've done one each year. They've done one for COP26. But I want to point out this one that was done for COP23, really important because, again, Canadian students were involved in this. And they say that they want their teachers to be uh, asking themselves these questions. They want to be exploring how colonization impacts climate change at a local, national, and global level. They want to see those links, explicit links between uh, decarbonization and decolonization. They, the climate crisis as a colonial crisis. These framings are ones that youth actually understand and want to see happening. They also want you to be asking how your classroom can decolonize thinking about climate change. So again, if we're centering youth and part of, part of nurturing their agency is centering their needs, their voice, what they're telling us, this is what they're telling us they want. So we need to be responding to that. We also know there are these barriers to integrating really robust climate change education. I know, <laughs> I have been there. Time, the challenge of incorporating what's seen as extra material into a demanding curriculum, the absence or lack of knowledge or access to resources, professional learning opportunities, fear of controversy surrounding climate change education and its political dimensions, uh, funding, Absolutely, funding is, a, is an issue. The policy, does the po policy is so uneven across Canada and there's been a lot of research to document this. So we feel hindered by these things. Is there anything else that you would add to this list of barriers? I'll give you a moment and feel free to add. What I wanna say is similar to what Sarah said, look at, the, look at what the ailment is that's preventing us from doing robust CCE. Um, and now let's respond, right? Like we can't just use this as we can't allow these, we have to find our way around these barriers, right? It's not easy. I know it's not easy, but um, this is part of what we have to be thinking through is how do we create 
those opportunities. And I, I encourage people at the highest levels of decision making that they need to be supporting teachers um, to actually engage with this work. Yes, and, and you've raised an excellent point, Jackson. We have to be dealing with our own emotions and finding spaces to process our own emotions about climate change and, and to be able to show up for kids in really healthy ways during this time, in really honest, authentic, and healthy ways. That's an excellent point. How do we do this work in developmentally, in ways that are developmentally appropriate? Well, from K to five, it is that focus on environmental relationships, connectivity and sensitivity to the natural environment, place-based sense-making, ecological concepts, and real-world problem solving, like tackling something in your community with young students is a beautiful developmentally appropriate way to engage them in climate change and climate justice education. When we get into the older grades, we can really dive into the analysis of issues, values clarification, discussion, debate, investigations, action-oriented responses, land-based and experiential learning, and real-world problem solving. And again, the resource list I'm gonna share with you is gonna offer you some suggestions. What is research telling us are some of the best practices for climate to, to help support young people to grapple with the climate crisis? We know that land-based learning through a D slash uncolonizing lens. So when we talk about that, we're talking about nurturing those kinship relationships to land and place. We are nurturing that sense of interconnectedness with students. We are, we are bringing in in respectful, not appropriative ways, indigenous knowledge systems and understandings and philosophies that actually talk about the human spirit and talk about the spirit of the water and the spirit of the trees. These are actually very good for our well being and mental health to think in those interconnected ways. Nurturing agency is one of the ways, that's why this talk is about how do we do that? Engaging critical inquiries and opportunities for knowledge construction. Students that get engaged with really robust, critical, creative, and collaborative thinking feel empowered by their learning and immersing students in experiential and real world problem solving contexts. Some key principles um, for nurturing agency is connecting students to the natural world through indigenous decolonizing approaches and pedagogies, supporting students in dealing with ecological loss and uncertainty with focus on the hopeful regenerative responses. There is a lot that is happening that is reason to hope. There are examples of, an, of regeneration that are happening all over the world and being undertaken by young people. I'm gonna share some examples a little bit later. Engaging students through those active knowledge building pedagogies, integrative thinking, critical thinking, knowledge building circles, experiential learning. Those are the kinds of pedagogies that really engage and support students. And building a sense of collective, collaborative action rooted in climate justice. For students not to feel the weight of the world is on their shoulders or their family's carbon footprint. Yes, we need to be taking those individual actions. They are important. We will continue to do that, but that needs to be situated and framed in the context of these collective movements, that we are a collective on the move demanding change. And we are gonna bring that change and we can't do it alone. We are going to do it together, bringing each of us our unique gifts, our unique social location, our unique context to the work of climate justice. That helps engender a hopeful, agentic response in students. So some ideas, again, I wanna seed the field um, before I get you into some breakout groups. Sarah, Sarah Ray talked about um, Joanna Macy's work, the work that reconnects. Some of you may be familiar with it. It was powerful work that she developed actually in response to Chernobyl and the nuclear disaster and how to regenerate in the context of that absolute um, horror that occurred. And she developed the work that reconnects, but it has been adapted by people. You can use this from youngest grades to adults. Um, and one of the examples from the work that reconnects is developing a council of all beings where students research and actually embody the different, a different element of, of creation 
I've had teachers who do a council of all plants. Um, I've done a, where I, we put logging companies on trial and we brought a bear, the spirit bear of the BC rainforest as a witness to that trial. And the students did the research and embodied the bear and the perspective of the bear. So these are ways that students can actually really feel their connection with their, the kinship relationships of the natural world and actually provides them with a lot of hope that they can channel the, their energy in that way. Art activities, um, the work of Andy Goldworthy, many of you may be familiar with it where you use found objects in the natural world. So that example in the top right is an example of some work of Andy Goldworthy that's been done by educators uh, where you can use found objects to, to, to be with nature in this way and celebrate its beauty and be grateful for it. The pedagogies of natural curiosity, I highly recommend that resource where they bring indigenous perspectives right into the center of land-based approaches to inquiry, an emphasis on reciprocity, a sense of spirituality, a deeply rooted sense of place and a recognition that everything is related. Then there are the pedagogies of experiential learning and problem solving, real world problem solving. The work of the Institute of Humane Education, I know uh, there was a webinar earlier this year with the fantastic Zoe Weil. Uh, the Solutionary Guidebook gives you ideas, the Design Thinking Handbook for Educators, I think is doing a Climate Change Challenge Kit this year, which is fantastic, engaging students from K to eight. Um, Actually, I think they're inviting high school students as well this year. It, you need to check with them with the challenge kit. So you can design an outdoor classroom as part of an authentic real world challenge, a safety plan for exploring natural areas together, assessing possibilities for renewable energy and waste reduction. When I know that when I engage my students in this more solutionary pedagogies, their sense of well-being and empowerment rose dramatically and they shared that with me in their reflections of how they felt despair and that they began to really feel like yes i am i am able to make a difference in my community so this is really really important and developing those powerful critical inquiries that offer those rich opportunities for creative, collaborative, and critical thinking. When students are thinking deeply about something, they really do get engaged by what they're learning. So what I wanna invite us to do right now is to get into breakout groups of about two to three people. So you have a nice small group because we're just gonna have 10 minutes. So I want you to have some, a good amount of time to share and to just share some of your ideas of how we can intentionally and impactfully nurture agency and authentic hope through the pedagogical choices, through what we're doing in our teaching and learning environments. So I will get you into uh, breakout rooms now. Are there any questions before you head out to the breakout room? Glad to hear it. If, you, if there's anything you wanna share, um, you know, that you think was important for the group, please do so in the chat. I did want to share with you um, the idea around, you know, the kinds of critical inquiries that we can engage our students in that help them care deeply about the world and take action. So the four young people here, you know, they, they are examples of student agency in action. They have each made such profound contributions in their community from Alex Lourdes, who's one of the young people who was involved in the court case Juliana versus the United States, where they have actually taken the United States government to court uh, around inaction on climate, to Vanessa Nakate, who leads the Fridays for Future Strikes um, in Kenya, Boyan Slat, who developed the device that actually cleans the oceans of plastic, and to Kea Blaney of Nyanin First Nation, who's done a lot of work around access to clean water. These are all young people who. Are, are models for students of agency in action. And um, some of you have been in a workshop with me before and I've shared this inquiry. I just wanna share some broad strokes because I've in the resource list, I'm gonna share with you information. There's a, you know, there is a, a video about how to scaffold a critical inquiry like this in your classroom. But just to give this idea around student engagement that in order to get students beyond just being compliant and on task 
and move them up to feeling empowered and transformed, we really do need to be inviting them into learning experiences where they are being asked to think critically, collaboratively, and creatively. And the research supports this. Uh, the deep learning, like in order to get at that deep learning, we need to be creating invitations for students to think deeply. And this is through work that I've done with the Critical Thinking Consortium, um, where we developed a unit on climate change. And I mean, it was about five years ago, and there's things that I would change about it now, but it still has a lot to offer. And I was able to test drive it in my own grade seven classroom. And the question we asked is, how should we respond to our changing earth? And that's a big question that you're going to be answering for the rest of your life. So in the eight weeks that we engaged in this unit, we created a little slice of a challenge to create a compelling multimedia message to the world to communicate powerful ideas and inspiring examples that will help us to respond sustainably. And we showed this video, um, again, this is in the resource list I'm sharing with you, from Shutezkat Martinez from the Earth Guardians at the Bioneers Conference, where he says, we did this on the very first day, and he says, there's no better time to be born than now. Like he documents all the devastation. And he says, there's no better time to be born than now. And we just use that to launch the students into the conversation. Like, do you agree with this? What do you think of this claim? Like he just told us about all the things that are happening, the deforestation, the floods, the hurricanes, the fires. And he's saying there's no better time to be born than now. And he's giving a vision for the future and what you as young people, um, the kind of future that you are going to be creating. And, and on the very first day, we got them to respond to that question. Like, if you had a message to the world, what would it be? And on the first day, this is an example of one of my students, you know, and he asked, my message to the world is to stop destroying forests and wildlife just to build condos and parking lots. I cannot give a specific example as this is happening way too much but to help save, to help stop this, make more wildlife and plant more trees. <clears throat> so this student for sure on this taxonomy of engagement cares, but we're not seeing in this first day, a lot of geographic evidence. <clears throat> we're not seeing a lot of deep thinking. Um, you know, this is where the student is at on the very first day of the unit. We then did a very, we scaffolded, I facilitated this critical inquiry with students. They kept a thought book. They were collecting powerful ideas. You can see them crossing off and highlighting the ones they think are the most powerful. You see them noting the date where they're collecting ideas as they're thinking about these complex issues where we looked at climate, we looked at water, we looked at land, um, we looked at vegetation. And we looked at what's changing. We looked at the, the we looked at the dimensions of each of those aspects of the environment and how it's changing and what can be done. And so it was a very, very rich critical inquiry. And this was the student's response on the final day. This is what the student said. I've learned that to be effective in my communication, I really have to show strong evidence to support my ideas. I learned how to find credible and relevant geographic evidence and how this strengthens what I am saying. This was an amazing learning experience. I feel changed. In the past, I was taught that yes, Climate change exists, but it felt like something out there, something that others would deal with. I now understand in detail what contributes to the issue and what its impacts are. I also see that I can join others to be part of the solution. I am committing to making changes and making a real difference. So when we look at that student's trajectory, and we, I go back to my quote about this, the classroom as a site of transformation, it's possible. It's possible. And the more that we bring our skillful use of certain pedagogies, it is incredible what we are able to accomplish in our classrooms and the way that we can support student well-being and their ability to take action and, and create really healthy futures um, you know, together, that we do that. To, we don't put the burden on them. We are with them and we are supporting them. And together, we are creating those futures. If you want to learn more around some of the things I've talked about in each of these books that the Critical Thinking Consortium has done, I've written a chapter around one is for elementary students, one is for secondary on approaches to climate change education. They're short chapters, but there's a lot of um, amazing resources around scaffolding critical inquiries in these resources. And again, I share that in the resource link that I'll post.
I also want to share with you some work that I've been doing with educators across North America with Green Teacher and Natural Curiosity, where they're designing critical inquiries. And when I see these critical inquiries, um, you know, coming to life, I get really excited to think about all of this happening in classrooms around North America, like healing gardens and regenerating land in their community, to um, taking action in their community, to shifting away of a linear economy to a circular economy and this kind of paradigm shift that teachers are taking on. So again, that's really the power of what's possible. So just to kind of come back, circle back around nurturing agency, um, connect students to the natural world through these indigenous decolonizing approaches and pedagogies, supporting students to deal with ecological loss and uncertainty with a focus on hopeful regenerative responses without bypassing their feelings. Like we got to get in our feelings because our it's our grief that Joanna Macy talks about from grief into action, from grief into vision. It's actually our grief that allows us to move into being courageous to do this work. Um, engage students through active knowledge building pedagogies and building a sense of collective collaborative action rooted in climate justice. Our classrooms are connected to those global movements, helping our students see that what goes on in our classroom is part of a global movement for change is profoundly hopeful for students. It truly is. And being able to, as I said, the work of Diana Hess and Avery around controversial issues, we need to walk towards controversy and support our, our students to engage in controversy more effectively rather than shy away from controversy as educators. So um, what I'm gonna invite you to do is I've got a Padlet and I, I'm just going to put it in the chat. So if you go to the Padlets just above the mentee um, post that I've put in there, if you go to the Padlet, I want to invite you right now to put your top three most impactful actions that you are taking or going to take to nurture agency and authentic hope in learners. So I want us to do our own knowledge building as a group and see the amazing things that we're planning to do. So if you go to the Padlet, again, second one from the top. Um, and what I'm gonna have you do, because we don't have a lot of time and I wanna take your questions. Um, I would love for this to be your exit ticket for the conference. I know Hillary may have an exit ticket for you, um, but if you could also make this an exit ticket, I would love for you to share your ideas and we and to keep that Padlet and revisit it. So we may not have time right now for you to put all three because uh, I do want to take some questions, but I would invite you to please do that today before you go. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say before we get to questions is, uh, what do I think our role as educators is? I'm, I'm going to put it out there what I think our role as educators is. I think our role in these times is supporting total system transformation <laughs> and creating a viable future with and for present and future generations. That's what I think the role of education is <laughs> right now in these times. Um, that I feel like should be the meaning and the North Star that guides us in our schools and in our communities and all of the amazing curriculum that comes out of doing that. Oh, to add a message on Padlet, the top, the bottom left corner sorry, the bottom right corner, if you're looking at it, there'll be a big pink button and you just press on that button. It should have a, a, a plus sign in that button. You just click on that and it is gonna allow you to, um, to do that. I also wanna share, and I'm gonna put something in the chat. My colleague in the PhD program is doing a research on black indigenous people of color educators and how they're teaching about climate justice at the secondary level or in community programs. And we know that racialized educator voices are not represented, they're underrepresented in climate change education scholarship. So it's really important to contribute to this. So even if you are not, you do not identify as a racialized educator, 
If you could share this call with others because there are survey links, if you know community organizations, this is such important research and we really, really want to make sure that we get those voices in this study um, so that we can contribute and center those voices in this work moving forward. So I'm going to post that in, in the chat box. Now what you'll see as well is I have Google Drive links to the resource list that I've created to the Youth Climate Change International Report, to the Anxiety to Agency This Presentation Key Slides for You, to the research call for participants. It's all there. I'm going to stop this share to take your questions. And as I do that, I'm going to pop PDFs of those documents in the chat, knowing that if you're on your phone or tablet, they don't show up, which is why I included them as Google links. Okay, so Soraya, I'm just going to see what you're saying in terms of Padlet. Um, if you look on the Padlet, oh, where is, oh, if you, if you just click on the Padlet, you'll see a, a pink circle in the bottom right hand corner with a plus sign. So if you just click on the Padlet, it, I promise you it will show up. You're saying it's not there? Even if you click on it, it's not in the bottom? No, it's yeah. not there currently, Maria. Huh. Did you actually, even when you click on it, because it's showing up on mine, that's so weird. Maybe it's a settings issue, like the sharing yeah. thing? Sharing. Let me see. No, it doesn't work right yeah, now. Yeah, I, I tried creating an account, and even then, like, I was able to make my own Padlet, but I couldn't connect to yours, Maria, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. The other, okay, that wasn't a problem with the other group, so something must be going on in the settings. Okay, I am... Oh, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. There we go. I just changed the setting. It was private. Uh huh. Sorry about that. Okay, try again. <laughs> Tell me it works. Let me know if that's working. And I'm here for if there's any questions, I'm just going to populate with the research call in a PDF, the uh, resource links from this presentation, PDF of key slides and the report. I'm putting that all in there. I'm going to also put the Padlet in again, just for good measure. So does it work now? It seems like it's still not working. It's still not oh. working. Oh boy. Maybe there's a new link. With the I mean, I refreshed the page too, but it's not working. Okay, okay. Let, me try, let me try this again. I am, okay, I am, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> okay, if you have any questions, I, while I'm working on that, feel free to ask some questions and I will so yes, oh, we have there about we go, there we go. There we go. We yes, have about okay. four or so minutes left in the seminar. So if you have questions, feel free to unmute and ask or put them in the chat for Maria to answer. Okay, I think I have done it, friends. I believe the Padlet is now writable. I've done <laughs> yes, it. Yes, yes. It's <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, I do want to. Also, I'll just share my contact information, um, my final slide here, just so if you do want to be in touch, I'd be happy to hear from you and let me know how I can support you. So that's my contact information. And I want to thank you um, for, for being in the session today. I hope that you were able to get some ideas, some inspiration. Um, that you do feel a little bit more empowered <laughs> yourself to continue in this important work that you're doing. I know that it is challenging and I really do feel that when we come together collectively in community, that's how we, we keep going and regenerate ourselves to do the work in our respective contexts. So thank you for all the work that you are doing. Uh, thank you to Maha, thank you to Jackson for supporting the session. And um, I, I will stick around for just a few more minutes if people do have questions. Okay, so given the time, I think we have enough time for like one question, maybe. So if anyone has anything to ask, please go ahead.
So if there are not any questions, um, let's do our wrap up. So uh, thank you so much again, Maria, for your time. And again, in the chat, uh, please do join me in thanking Maria for her time and all that she's shared with us. Um, so Maria, the point that you were making about classrooms being places of profound change and action and collaboration, just wow, I think it's been really impactful for me, how incredible that you're doing such work, um, you know, having students not just engage, but be empowered to make that individual difference and see themselves be as part of a collective and that we're in this together. So your point on together, this was really, really powerful. And I'm sure the attendees and myself will be taking away much from your brilliant talk and uh, you brought so much hope forward. And thank you so much for all that work that you are doing. You're making a good and powerful difference um, and your work and knowledge are deeply appreciated. Um, so lots of love in the chat for you. Uh, thank you so, so much, everyone. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, so this marks the end of our seminar. Uh, so this meeting room will be closed. Uh, thank you again to our presenter, uh, Maria, and our OISE volunteer, Jackson, for, um, for sharing their time, and to all the participants for attending. Uh, so please do have a wonderful experience in the rest of the conference. The Eco Fair will be on, so please do join us there. We look forward to seeing you. <laughs>